Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's start. I'm quiet. Everybody knows me, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm back. Yeah, here I am. I dressed in a very noisy shirt so you'll look at me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about gene function prediction. Oh, I don't have that little tool I had before, so I'm going to have to walk back and forth. Okay. Um, okay, good. Now I have a pointer, and we're good. Okay, so let's see what we're going to learn about today. All right, so um, as I said before, I mean, what I'm trying to relate to you in these modules is the concepts. And in the lab, we're going to use a specific tool for doing gene function prediction, and it's, it's one that I helped develop. And I think it's a great tool, obviously. Um, and there are other tools for doing this type of thing, and th those are linked to in the wiki. Uh, and th there's some that I might not have uh, uh, updated the, the links to, to have, but all these tools have the same concepts incorporated in them. Right? And so what's important in this lecture is, is for me to communicate these concepts to you so that, that they can generalize from the tool that we're going to work on during the lab to other tools that you might want to use as well. Right? And when you read other people's papers, then you understand what the concepts are. Okay, so the concepts that, that we're going to talk about is a functional interaction network. And then Rob has already induced, introduced this term earlier today, and then we talked a little bit, I think a little bit about it uh, yesterday as well. So just to try to make that, I've just been trying to make that concept clear to you. And then this other concept of guilt by association, which we've also talked about. And the concept that I'm going to introduce, which is a gene recommender system. Um, now, uh, we're also, this is a little bit complicated here, this concept of uh, context-specific network rating schemes. And so, so what, what Robin introduced to you this morning was, was something called the FI network, the Functional Interaction Network. I think that's what it stands for. And, and what that network was, uh, was uh, produced, how that network was produced was combining together networks from a whole bunch of different sources. Right? Now, now, how you combine networks together sometimes should depend upon the question that you want to ask the final network. And so if you have a, uh, the way you combine networks, if you have it depend upon the question that you're asking the network to answer, then I'm going to call that context specific. Okay. The other thing is, is I want you to understand the difference between two different ways of predicting gene function or implementing guilt by association. That's genetic, genetic, uh, direct interaction and label propagation. And there's two distinct ways of doing this that are related to one another. Uh, and then I want you to be able to use gene recommender system to answer two types of questions about gene function. The first one is, what does my gene do? Do you have a single question you want to, you have a single gene you want to find out more about that gene? And the other question is, give me more genes like this. I guess this is, that's a demand rather than a question. But that's a, that's a different way of interacting with a gene recommender system, right? Okay. Uh, and then finally, I want you to be able to select the appropriate network weighting scheme to answer your questions about gene function. Okay. All right. And then the outline is, are, is basically going to follow this, but in the first part is going to be communicating these concepts, and then we're going to look at the tool, uh, Gene Mania, and then we're also going to very briefly, I'm going to talk, introduce this tool, String, which is you know, the major other tool for doing the types of things that I'm going to be explaining today. But there are a whole bunch of other minor tools that, that cover different sets of organisms. Okay, so you want to use genome-wide data in the lab. Great. So people, you've spent millions or actually billions of dollars have been spent by various governments to generate these what like network data about how genes are linked together and also uh, expression data, for example, how genes are expressed under a variety of different conditions in a variety of different organisms. And there's been tons of annotation work that's gone into reading the literature to build these pathway databases that give these pathway networks. So when you're asking questions about your gene list or individual genes, you, in some ways you want to take all that information into account when you are when you're when you're trying to find out more. Right? So, but you know, until recently, you kind of had to be a computer scientist to bring all this stuff together. Right? Because all these networks are stored in different places. The meaning of these networks isn't entirely clear. And so a lot of this work that I'm going to be talking to you about in developing the gene recommender systems is a way of providing a simple interface to this ty these types of network data in order to make it useful to you 
in, you know, in your work without you having to understand necessarily the specific details of all, the, all, this network was, all these networks were generated and what all the interactions mean and how to combine them together. And then Robin this morning talked about one way of doing that, and that's in terms of doing this clustering within the network and doing sub-network analysis. Okay. okay. So what is a functional interaction network? So you should never use, uh, this was like a whole figure, but you can see this kind of red and green here, right? All right, and this is, a, this, is a, you know, this is a figure taken from a really early paper, just soon right after microarrays were first described, and this is a paper that used a microarray, I think it was a yeast microarray, yeah, to, to measure gene expression under a variety of different conditions where the, the cells have been perturbed in various different ways, either through a knockout mutant or uh, through changes in, I think, the, um, the media that they were grown in. And the, one of the first things that was uh, discovered is that if you just take the genes and then you arrange them from top to bottom in such a way that genes have like uh, similar patterns of expression right beside each other, and then you put down a label of the function of the genes, as you look down the list, you see that there are these long areas where the genes have very similar expression patterns and they all have the same function. All right, and this, is, this led to this idea of what's called a functional interaction network, where you have a way of building a network that where the nodes, in this case, correspond to genes, and the links between genes correspond to, in this case, the, the degree of uh, correlation of the uh, microarray expression profile. But those links and the strength of those links can be interpreted as evidence that those the, the genes that are linked by those that edge share function. Yeah. What? Well, that's that's what we're going to be talking about. But so in this case, we're saying there's some aspect of their function that's shared, right? And different types of networks and different types of functional interaction networks might better capture different types of function. Well, in this case, in microarray expression, yes, it would share the same regulation, but it might also mean that it shares the same sort of biological function, right? So if this, instead of being yeast that have been perturbed using uh, you know, you know, different deletions or, or, or you know, different chemicals that you add to their, their media, and you looked at gene expression across a set of human tissues, all the genes that are uniquely expressed in the eye, they're probably playing some role in vision. Right? <laughs> but we'll get back to this. You can answer your questions and we can have this argument later on in the talk because I'm going to ask some more questions about what gene function actually means. But these are, these are great questions and I love this discussion. Okay. So, so there's a, diff a variety, lot of varieties of so-called functional interaction network. And you know, admittedly, this idea is very vague. And it is a vague idea. Right? And that's why we have to try to make it, that's why I think we have to come up with these gene recommender systems to provide a different way of interacting with these networks. So I'm going to distinguish between directly measured interactions. So these are ways of like measuring whether or not two genes have uh, specifically interact with one another. What do I mean by that? So protein-protein uh, interaction networks, or just protein interaction networks, they're trying to measure whether or not the, the protein products of two genes are physically linked together. Right? Now we can argue about the exact interpretation of protein-protein interaction networks and it's going to depend upon how that, those protein links were generated and maybe Francis is going to start that argument. That's the same thing, you just did not produce the protein Right. Right. They're close enough yeah. <laughs> to be... <laughs> right. So you, there's a lot of interpretation problems with these data, right? Okay, and then another way that people do directly uh, uh, measured interactions are so-called genetic interaction networks. So there, two genes are connected by an edge if there's some sort of epistetic interaction between deletion mutants of these two genes. Right. They don't have to be touching. But what I'm trying to distinguish here is these are, these are where you're directly doing measurements on pairs of genes. Now, what I talked about in the previous slide was inferring interactions from a single data source. So there, we're not directly measuring pairs of genes. What, we're, what we were measuring is we were measuring gene expression across a whole bunch of different conditions, and we were inferring interactions by, for in this case, computing the correlation between the pairs of genes. 
right? And so that's like a, that's those are inferred interactions. And what do those interactions mean? I don't really know, right? Co-regulation interactions probably, uh, but they can also be interpreted as shared function under some conditions. Okay. Um, now, what Robin talked to you about this morning was inferring interactions from multiple data sources. Right? And there's a whole bunch of sort of what I'm going to call context-independent ways of doing this. And basically, the idea is, is that you take these networks. These are directly measured interactions. These are inferred interactions from a uh, single data source. And what I haven't included here is networks that you get from like pathway databases. For example, you know, I don't know, you're looking at the Krebs cycle and you're connecting everything that shares uh, serves metabolite. Right? Um, and, you're, and then you're merging all those networks into one network. Which, uh, which was called the Functional Interaction Network, or the FI network this morning, right? And there, you know, if you have more of these networks that, that say these two genes are linked in some somewhat obscure way, that provides greater confidence to you that these links share some sort of aspect of their function, okay? And that's a context-independent functional uh, interaction network. So I'm also going to talk to, uh, today about ways of deriving context-dependent interaction networks, where you're asking the question, say I have a set of genes, I want to find more genes like these. Well, how would you find more genes like these using networks? Well, first of all, you'd find out whether or which networks best reproduce this set of genes. And then you use those types of networks to find more genes like those. Okay, and I'll, I'll make that idea a little bit clearer as we move through the, um, uh, my presentation. So as I said, Previously, there's two types of functional predictions. The first one is, what does my gene do? I have a single gene, and I want to know more about it. And so if I look at other genes that it's functionally linked to, I might be able to find out more about what that gene does based on the set of genes that it's functionally linked to. And the other question is, give me more genes like this. So find me more genes in the link signaling pathway. I've done that before. Find me more kinases. That should be pretty easy, actually. Find me more members of a protein complex. That might be easier, that might be hard. But these are the types of questions that you might have, okay? And there's one other further question that's very similar to this question. I have a list of genes. Tell me how these genes are linked together, okay? And Robin talked a little bit about that this morning as well. Okay, so how do, what does my gene do? So here's the, here's the protocol. You have all your network data, and maybe you have profile data, like the expression patterns, and your query list consists of a single gene, you put these two types of data together in what I'm going to call the gene recommender system. So this is like, you know, when you buy a book on Amazon, Amazon tells you what other books you might like, right? This is the same thing, except it tells you what other genes you might like. And then the output here is your gene plus all the other genes that it's linked to, and it looks like a hairball mess here, but what this is telling you is how those genes are linked together. And each one of these different colors here corresponds to a different type of evidence or a different type of information. So there's two types of information, say, that link these two genes down, uh, down here together. I guess the pink type and the green type, and I'll be more clear about what that is in a second. And then using guilt by association, you can try to infer the function of this gene based on the functions of the things that are, it's linked to. Yeah? Can you use the prediction of 48 as an example? Yeah. Oh, is that 42? 42. Whoa, that's really weird. Um, okay, you're the first person who noticed that. Noticed that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I don't know what happened there. I probably just copied that down wrong. I, I assume this one. CDC 48. That's supposed to be CDC 48. Okay. Yeah, that's just a, uh, yeah. Thanks for catching that. Um, yeah, and so now what I've done here is I've just colored all the genes that are involved in this function. All right, and you can see that CDC 42 is linked to a whole bunch of genes that are involved in small G GTPA mediated single signal transduction, right? So now that's already been annotated with this, with this particular function, but you might annotate it with that function based on the fact that its neighbors, um, uh, more than half of its neighbors have that function. And an easy way to do that is just to do a gene function enrichment analysis of the neighboring genes to find out what functions are enriched in that set. Okay. So that's one way of interacting with the gene recommender system. Okay, and so to, to do this type of analysis, you use all these types of data. Now you can't use what I'm calling context-dependent de interactions because you don't know what question's being asked when someone gives you a single gene, right? You could be asking a bunch, uh, bunch of different questions, right? So if you say, what does P53 do? 
you should say, what does TP53 do? Because that's a gene symbol for fit, uh, P53. So that question could be a lot, uh, about a lot of different aspects of its function, right? And then the biological function that a, that a gene is, uh, participates in doesn't necessarily match particularly its molecular function, right? Or you could ask, be asking what the role of P53 is in disease, and everybody knows what that is, right? So, so in terms of trying to figure out what aspect of function and then answer those types of questions, some types of networks might be better for some types of gene function than others. So, so how would you, and, and so that's what these context-dependent networks are about. Now, how would, you, how would you figure out what question someone's asking? I mean, they could, you know, they could put it in. They could type in what aspect of function that they're interested in. But there's another way of doing that, and that's defining the question by providing some context. So the first time I gave this slide, I was uh, invited to give a talk on this in Memphis, Tennessee. Right? And so Memphis has two meanings, right? depending upon whether or not you put it in context of Knoxville and Nashville or Alexandria and Cairo, right? So if I say, tell me what Memphis, you know, tell me more things like Memphis and these two other things, these are two other towns that are in, uh, that are in Tennessee, tell me more things about Memphis and these two other things, these are other towns or cities that are in Egypt. Okay? So the context can provide you, if you give a few examples of something, that can help you to provide, which, uh, as provide you know, say what your question is. And that's to give me more genes like these. So here you have some query lists, you have the same type of data, you put this information into a gene recommender system, and then what the gene recommender system will be doing is, is, a, is two different things. One is it's going to find genes that are highly linked to this set of genes, right, where, you know, presumably you hope that new genes that it adds are linked to more than one of these genes. And the other thing that it can do, if you give it a list, a query list like this, it can find what networks are best able to reproduce this query list, right? What networks, in what networks are these, are these genes all well linked together? And if you find the networks where these are all well linked together, those are probably the networks that you should use to find more genes like those. Okay. All right, so this is the system that I'm going to be showing you today. It's called Gmania. It does exactly these things. There's other systems that try to do something similar and, and do, do so. Um, and this is just a screenshot of the website, which we're going to be going through, going over um, uh, later in the talk. And so here, um, what I'm showing here is uh, the different types of, I put in this query list, and the query, uh, the genes that are in the query list are represented here by, uh, by big nodes. And then the small round nodes represent other genes that are, that are inferred to be like that, the set of genes in the query list. The colors of nodes indicate the, the annotated function of genes in the query list, and in some cases, genes not in the query list. And then there's these little triangles here, and these triangles correspond to um, features that are shared by groups of genes. And so in these cases, the triangles correspond to different molecular functions that these genes participate in. So, uh, NO synthesis, for example, I guess. I think I'll read that. Maybe you can read it better. And the, the links are colored by the types of networks that link the genes together. And you know, here's the functions down here. And these, this information here is telling you how much each one of these types of networks contributes to the, um, the overall network diagram that's being shown here. So, in terms of finding more genes like this, uh, these interpro domains, which are which are protein domains, and they're the ones that contribute the most to finding more genes in this list, and they're the ones that contribute most to sorry finding genes in this list originally, and they're the ones that contribute most to finding more genes in this list. Well, that was a complicated slide. Okay, don't worry, we're gonna get, we're gonna get back to this. Okay, so how does this work? All right, so maybe you guys want to call up the website now. Maybe. Um, if you want to do, just type Gmania into Google. And our website is designed to take lots of simultaneous users, but things might be slow. So we'll see.
Might as well just switch it to uh, service CI, to yeast. Okay, so you don't have to type that in. This, this list of genes, you'll get it by just clicking on that example thing. But if you click on that example when you're in human, you're gonna get a list of human genes, which is fine, but then don't change to yeast. You can change to yeast, or you can just go with human, which is the default. You just have to press example. And then if you click on what's, what's called show advanced options, this network list is gonna show up. Now please don't click on any of these networks. You can do it if you want, but it's gonna be a bit slower. Um, not that much slower, but it'll be a little bit slower. But I just want you to open up this advanced options panel and see that there's different types of networks that are being represented, and we, by default, selected a subset of them for you. All right. Those of you who are with me can press go. Even when people who aren't with me can press go. If you, but if you have no genes in there, it's going to complain. Okay, so this is more about the network stuff. Let's skip this slide. Man, there's a lot about the network stuff. I'd forgotten how much I talked about this group. Okay, do, you, do people have an answer? Okay, so that, the, what you're seeing looks a lot different than this, but there's going to be a little um, phrase near the top right, right under the gene box that says show advanced options. If you click on that phrase, you'll get this thing again. Maybe. You're free to do things now. This is, this is, it's just supposed to be, you're just supposed to have fun with this. this the website, the website, it's not, nothing's going to break. You can fool around as much as you want with this website. And it's actually designed to be relatively intuitive. I mean, nothing with a lot of features is ever intuitive. But it's, it's, it's you know, it's designed to kind of be fun to play around with. At least that's what I want. I want it to be fun when I use it. But if you click on the show advanced options, you'll get this thing down. And then if you, if you click on one of the network types, and what you see might differ from this slightly. So here, this tells you, here in this case, we have 95 co-expression networks, of which 20 are selected. But if you click on either uh, any of these network types, it'll uh, pull up a long list of networks. Here, there's only one, where you can click or click on or click off in individual networks. And then when you click on this arrow, it's gonna open everything up. It's kind of intuitive. And then you can figure out where that network comes from, and there's some information on it. And it's just really fun to play, play around with this thing. Okay, and then when you're happy, you can just press go again, and it's gonna give you uh, another search using the networks that you've selected. Whoa, okay. No fun to get surprised by your own slide. All right, so um, these are the convex independent networks, and I've actually already explained what those things are. So if you have a co-expression network, you have a genetic interaction network, you have a protein interaction network, and you don't want to worry about context, one thing you can do is each one of these edges is associated with some weight. Right? And so when we made this co-expression network, the weight here was like the co-expression, the Pearson correlation coefficient. <laughs> might be some normalized version of this. Right? For the genetic interaction network, it might just be one or zero what that weight is. And for the protein interaction network, it might also be one or zero, or it might be the count of the number of times that interaction has appeared. But regardless, you get a weight for every network. And the way in which you generate either the, uh, the functional interaction network that, uh, that Robin talked about or any of these other context independent networks is you just multiply that weight by some number. That's how much you trust the network. And then you, you sum the weight times that scale factor. Um, sorry, for every pair of genes, you multiply uh, each, the weight between that pair of genes by some scale factor which tells you how much you trust the network, and then you sum that weight across all the networks. Yeah. God, that's a terrible way of explaining it. 
explain that. Okay, we have a pair of genes here. Right? This pair of genes, CBC23 and APC11, they have a weight in every single one of these network types. Right? If they're not connected, that weight is zero. If they are connected, that weight could be one, it could be some real value, it could be anything. So the way in which I'm going to figure out what the weight between CBC23 and APC11 is in my context-independent network, or the FI network, is I'm going to take the weight, and then I'm going to multiply it by some number that's assigned to each network type. Right? And so what you're seeing in G-mania, if you have the network thing, is you see a percentage. That could be the number that you're going to multiply it by. The way in which the functional interaction network that Robin talked about this morning is generated is using a procedure called uh, naive Bayes. And what naive Bayes says is basically it scores networks by how well it's able to reproduce known functional links between genes. So different types of networks provide better or worse data. Okay, so each network has a weight. Each pair of genes has its own edge weight within the network. To get the edge weight of, for a pair of genes in the combined network, you take their edge weights in each of the individual networks and then multiply those edge weights by the network weight. You sum those things up and that gives you the weight here. Okay. I don't know why I spent that much time on that slide. Okay, great. All right. What's different with the context dependent networks is you just re you, you don't use a single weight, you reassign that weight based on your query list. Right? So your query list tells you how good each one of these networks is at reproducing the query list, meaning that how well connected that query list is in that network. And so here are the the weights that are specific to the query list that contains these six genes. Okay? And that's the only difference between a context-independent and a context-dependent network is how the weights are assigned. In the context, in the, the network weights. And in a context-independent network, you use the same network weights regardless of the question that you're asking. In this case, you use different network weights depending upon the question that you ask. And those weights are inferred based on the list that you put into the, in, into the tool. Okay? Are the weights uh, supervised by itself or is generated by, by the genome? It's generated by Gmania. It's generated by Gmania based on your query list. Okay. Yeah. So it's just the option to select with or without weights. Yeah. So you you'll always get weights. It's the only the only difference is is how those weights are determined. And there's there's a variety of different ways within Gmania to determine how those weights are determined. Some of them depend on the query list, and some of them don't depend. So if the ones that depend on the query list, how do you determine those weights? Well, if you give a network a non-zero weight, that network should be relevant to predicting the function of interest, right? It should link together the genes in your list. You also want to give, you want down weight networks that are redundant. So a lot of times, microarray expression profiling experiments measure basically the same thing. Co-regulation is, is what people have said. Right? And a lot of microarray expression data sets, what they mostly measure in terms of co-regulation is differences in growth. Right? So one of the major responses that at least yeast cells have when you perturb them in some way, they grow slower or they grow more quickly. Right? When something grows slower or grows more quickly, that means it's a cycling through cell cycle faster or, or slower. And a lot of the gene expression changes that you see come from the fact that the population is has is in different uh, a different proportion of the populations are in different cell cycle stages. Right. This is true of yeast cells. It was also true when we did a similar analysis for human cells. You could certainly detect a very strong signature of growth when the gene expression patterns in different uh, different human tissues. Okay. So as I said, there's there's a bunch of different network weighting schemes that you can use. Um, and these are all accessible from the advanced options panel. Uh, by default, Gmania just decides between the query specific weighting and the query independent weighting based on the size of the list. If you have a long list, it's going to, it's going to try to weight the networks based on your list. If you have a short list, 
it's going to weight the networks based on how well they reproduce known functional interactions between genes. All right, so a network that's just you know randomly connects genes together is going to get zero weight because the, the links in the network are not tending to link together genes that actually have the same function. Okay? And we figure that out by comparing that network to networks that are constructed based on gene ontology annotations. So if two genes have a similar set of gene ontology annotations in the constructed network, they're linked together. And if that, if the experimental network looks similar to the gene ontology network, then we give it a high weight. Right? And our network weighting schemes are based on different hierarchies in gene ontology. So there's the biological process hierarchy, the molecular function hierarchy, or the cellular component hierarchy. If you don't do anything, it chooses biological process, but you can, you can tell it to choose molecular function and cellular component if you want, if you're looking for something different. Okay. Also, if you don't trust anything that we're doing, you can, you can just assign all the networks equal weighting. You can weight either equally by data type, so all the networks here are organized in different categories of network, like co-expression, protein interaction, or you can weight it equally by network. Okay, and I've just been through these points. Okay, so we've talked about uh, network weighting. We've talked about um, uh, what a functional interaction network is. Uh, we've talked about how you can decide how to weight networks based on uh, the genes that are in your list. Now, once you have a network, how do you find the, ge uh, the genes that are associated with it? How do you find the genes that are highly linked to it? Okay. And certainly with a single gene, that is kind of, it is a more complicated question than you, might, uh, than you might think. But when I give you a set of genes, that becomes an even more complicated question. Right? So if I say that these are the genes in my query list, I'm trying to find more genes like these four, and these, this is the network that I have, which of these genes is most like these four genes? Probably this one, right? Because it's linked to two, but it's got two linked together, right? And then maybe the next one you might say would be this one. But if we're, we're extending that list beyond two, there's a bunch of other genes that we need to consider here, right? There's these two genes here, that neither of which are directly linked to these four. But somehow these seem like they would be different than these genes over here, which have no linkage at all. There's no path from these genes to these genes. Right? So if you think about this as some sort of pathway diagram, you might want genes that are later in the pathway to be, to be functionally associated with the genes that are earlier in the pathway, even if there's not a direct linkage. Right? So there's two types of algorithms that people use for finding guilty associates, for doing predicting gene function by guilt by association. Okay. Uh, these are, they look like yeast genes. <coughs> you can just type them in. Let's find out. Do you want me to type it in? Or do we can, you can just do it at, 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 uh, when, in the lab. Okay, yeah. <coughs> oh, okay, so. So the, the principle behind guilt by association is you say that genes that are linked together in some way, functionally linked, have a function interaction with other genes, tend to share function. So if you want to find more genes that have whatever function is represented by these four, and I provided you with a network that looks like this, which of these seven genes is most likely to share the, the function of these four? Which one is second most likely to share the function of these four? Which is third most likely? What's fourth most likely? And so forth. And so what we're trying to do here is we're just trying to find a way of scoring these seven genes according to how well linked they are to this, this group of four. And this is, this is, you can call this predicting gene function. You can, uh, you can call this uh, trying to do guilt by association. But I'm just trying to say that there's two main types of algorithms, and all the algorithms fall into one of two different classes. One type of algorithm is called direct interaction. I call it direct interaction. People call it naive phase. They, sometimes they just call it guilt by association. Sometimes they just call it nearest neighbor. And what direct interaction does 
is for every one of the nodes in the network, which correspond to G, it looks at its neighbors, and the score depends upon what proportion of its neighbors are in series N, and the, uh, the strength of the link between the, uh, uh, between the gene and its neighbors. Okay, so you can see in this case, these two genes score highly than the other five genes, because they're the only two that directly interact with the, the gene. Right, but what, what you don't get from this type of algorithm is you don't find out that this gene is probably closer to these four than, say, these three genes that aren't connected in any way. Okay, and then the algorithms that, that try to do that are called label propagation algorithms. And so if you apply a label propagation algorithm in this case, what you would get would be something like this. So this gene is the most highly linked, this is the second most highly linked, but then this is the third most highly linked because you can see there's a lot of paths from this gene to these genes in the query set. This one's the fourth most highly linked, and then these ones aren't linked at all. All right, it's a very simple idea. And it's related to um, this idea of uh, that the hot net, the heat diffusion that, uh, that Robin talked about this morning. And basically the idea is, is that you, you score genes by direct interaction, then you rescore the genes if you haven't already scored, and then you rescore the genes that haven't already scored. So you propagate the information through the network about which the positive examples are. And the way the equations work is it corresponds to something like propagating heat through a lattice where you have some like loss at each one of these nodes. Or you can think of like you have some water sources and you're pushing water through the network where you have some loss at each one of these nodes. So the further the, uh, the node is away from here, the less water, less heat that gets to it, right? And how much heat or water gets there depends upon how much heat or water got to the other node that it's connected to. And the whole thing balances out. Yeah? So um, Reactome, uh, what we're doing, what String's doing, they're all derived from multiple sources. The sources vary a little bit, um, and the way in which the sources are combined varies a little bit. And what I was trying to distinguish earlier is where you use a fixed combination, so you use the, the same way of combining the sources regardless of the question you're asking or the gene list that you put in, and where the how you weight the sources depends upon the gene list that you put in. Right. And so that's, that's, those are the only differences. But you know, under the hood, a lot of these algorithms are essentially identical to one another. Right? Or conceptually they're identical and the, the details vary a little bit. Right? But the only conceptual thing that I want you to get is that you're combining together uh, data from multiple sources. The way in which you combine together data is you just sum up the link weights between pairs of genes. And you can adjust how much you believe one source by, by re-weighting the links in, from that source by like scaling them up, all up or all down if you don't trust the source. Uh, and the final thing is that in some cases, the way in which you combine the data sources together doesn't depend on the question you're asking, and sometimes it does. And so that's the context-dependent network, so the ones where the the, the weights that you assign, the evidence weights you assign each one of the sources depends on the question you're asking. Okay. And so does the weight model depend on the interaction Okay, so within a network, like in the co-expression data set, right? you would think things that are highly correlated should be more highly linked to one another, right? Okay, so within a network, all the links have weights, all the edges have weights that tell you the relative um, the confidence that you have that these two link, genes are linked together. Okay, so now that's, so the networks themselves each have different weights between pairs of genes, but how much you believe a type of network or a network derived from a single study might vary from network to network. So the way in which you incorporate information about how much you believe a study 
is to like basically take the, the weights that are in the network and scale them up or scale them down. Right? So let's say one is the is the most strongly linked pair of genes in the network. Right? And in the co-expression network, those are genes that are perfectly co-expressed with one another. Right? And then we want to we want to take the evidence for functional linkage from a co-expression network and we want to combine it for evidence of functional linkage from the protein-protein interaction network. In the protein-protein interaction network, let's just say all the links are one or zero. One means that they they like, you know, they they were like co-purified, and zero means that they didn't, for example. So now how do we combine the gene expression network with the protein-protein interaction network? Well, we could just add the link weights together. So now we have link weights between one, uh, zero and two. Right? So you have the perfect link G, uh, pair of genes in the co-expression network. If they're also physically linked to one another somehow, you sum those, weight, the, those link weights together, you get two. Right? But maybe we trust protein-protein interaction studies more than we trust co-expression studies. So like the perfectly co-expressed pair of genes, maybe in the units of link weight in the protein interaction thing, it should be like 10% of those units. So we just scale all the co-expression links by 0.1. So now the strongest evidence we have in co-expression is a link of 0.1. The strongest evidence we have in protein interaction is a link of 1. We add them together, and this, the highest nut value we get is 1.1. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. So, so there's, there's, scale, there's differences within the network and how strongly linked the pairs of genes are. But then you can assign the network an overall weight that, that, that says how confident you are in this source of data about gene linkage. Okay, so those weights, so all the methods that you've ever seen really that combine uh, data from different sources use the same technique. They, they weight the data from different sources, they scale the link weights within a network according to the, the weight that that data gets. And those weights are decided in a variety of ways. One of the ways the weights are decided is by saying, okay, how well does this network reproduce what we already know about gene function? Like, if a, if a pair of genes are linked in this network, do they have the same function and annotations in gene ontology? And then you can, you can derive the network weight based on that comparison. So now, once we have the network, the question is how we propagate information through the network. And then we, that's what these two types of algorithms are. One is we propagate information through the network by just looking at the other genes that a gene is linked to and not considering indirect neighbors, right? So this thing, this, this node right here has no neighbors. It's not linked to any of these, these red genes, but it does seem closer than this node. Right, because there's a path to these genes. And this one actually has a bunch of paths, and this one only has the one path. Well, I guess it has a path that goes like this, but it's kind of longer. So you can look at things that are just directly linked to other nodes in the network that you've come up with, or you can try to propagate information through the network by, in this case, what you're doing is essentially something like counting the number of weighted paths to the red nodes. And the score reflects that. Okay, but the you know conceptually the way to think about it is, is these these are horse, uh, these are sources of heat, these are sinks of heat that also allow some uh, some heat to go out from the node, and you're just letting the heat propagate through the network, and then finding out how much heat you get at each one of the nodes at the end, right? So here no heat gets over there because there's no link to any of the sources. Okay. All right. All right. I think you guys don't care about this stuff very much. That's what I'm getting. So, so I'm going to skip over this stuff. <laughs> and I'm going to start talking about the tool. But I'll, I'll go back and explain this stuff if you do end up caring about it. Okay. So what are the three parts of gene mania? So the first thing is, and these are, this is true of gene recommender systems in general, so it's a large, automatically updated collection of interaction networks. There were some questions yesterday about where we get this data on the interaction networks. Well, we, we collect them for you. 
right? So we are kind of a network database where we compile information from a bunch of different sources. Um, we also have a query algorithm to find genes and networks that are functionally associated to the, the query genes. So we analyze the gene list if it's long enough to tell you what networks uh, are highly linked among the, uh, that have a lot of links among the query list, and we also uh, analyze the query list to find out what genes are highly linked to it. And then we also provide this information to you in a network browser, which some of you have already seen, and then if you fool around, there's extensive link outs that, that take you to da databases where you can find out more information about the source of interactions or the genes that, you, that, uh, that are being linked to. Okay, so what are our data sources? Um, so we get uh, co-expression information by, we go to Gene Expression Omnibus, we download all the studies for the organisms, uh, that we're interested in that have a sufficient number of samples that we trust the co-expression measurements. I think it's like 12 for human or maybe 20. We compute the co-expression networks from all those experiments and then we, we put them in our database. Um, in terms of like genetic and physical interactions, we, we use a source called the IREF index. And what is IREF index? IREF index is um, this guy, uh, Ian Donaldson, what he does is he goes through, and he, you've heard about Mint today and Intact, and there's all these like organizations that what they do is they annotate physical interactions that have either appeared in high throughput studies or that are in like what I call like small scale. So you have like some, you have like a paper which describes physical interactions between a couple pairs of genes. Well, there's multiple independent organizations that are curating those papers all the time. And they, every once in a while, they come up with a new physical interaction network. And those networks become available through a service called Psychic. And then Ian, what he does is he takes all that information together and makes what's called the IREF index, where all the physical interactions are identified by the data sources they came from, so there's a lot of information available. So we don't download that. He compiles physical interaction data together we download what he generates, and then we split it up by data source. We also, we also have predicted interactions. And these are things that are called interlogs. So what's an interlog? Does anyone know? OK, so if you find out that two proteins uh, physically interact in mouse, do you think they interact in human? Yeah, right? So what interlog is, interactions among orthologs, right? So if you have a pair of genes, orthologous genes, in another organism, and you find out that, the, you know, in the one organism, let's say mouse, that they interact, you have two identical orthologs in human, you have strong evidence that they interact in human. Now those are predicted interactions, right? Those weren't, those weren't directly measured in human. So you have to incorporate information about whether or not the gene is duplicated, how, uh, how well conserved it is, possibly some other side information. Are they expressed under the same conditions? That can change as well. And so we, we use the I2D uh, database to identify interlogs, and we put uh, uh, those interactions in the predicted interaction. A great way of figuring out what the function of the gene is is, is to see what protein domains it has. Right, so everybody, so, so if you find out that two genes have the same set of protein domains, that's often very strong evidence that they have at least some part of their function is shared, right? So, so we generate uh, networks based on how many protein domains uh, uh, a pair of genes share and how common those protein domains are. And we call them the shared protein domain networks, and we use interpro to get information about protein domains. We also get information about uh, synthetic genetic interactions um, uh, among genes from uh, the BioGrid database. We have pathway information from a variety of databases, including Reactome. And we have this new type of data that uh, called attributes. What is an attribute? So, so, so far I've been talking to you about networks, right? Where you have uh, links between a pair of genes. But genes also have, say, attributes. Attributes are like annotations that have been assigned to a gene something like this sort of shared protein domain. So you can say like a, a, the presence of a protein domain is an annotation, but there's other annotations that the gene can have. For example, it can be predicted to be a, a target of a microarray, sorry, of a microRNA. It can be predicted to interact with a, uh, with a drug. A gene can be assigned to a specific pathway. 
And so we say that two genes are likely to share function if they have similar types of attributes. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's all our network data. That's all the types of things that we use for gene function prediction. By default, we don't include the attribute information. Sometimes that can be a bit circular. And by default, we only include 20 co-expression networks because a lot of the, because there's so many co-expression studies, we get a lot of network data from co-expressions. And when we include a lot of networks in our analysis, things slow down a little bit. And so we feel like a lot of the co-expression data might be redundant. And because it slows things down so much, we only include the top 20 most informative co-expression networks by default. But you can turn them all on if you want. OK, and we have some organism-specific databases because some organisms are, are well represented by, uh, by, their model, uh, by their model organism databases, and some are less so. But if you click around, you can see what's, what's available just by clicking these things and see, you know, see what networks come up. So the other thing that we try to do why this, this shows me the slide that I'm on and not the slide that I'm going to. It's not useful at all because I can see the slide that I'm on, right? What? You're going to do okay, right. And so that's what I thought. So, so we talked earlier about this problem of like genes have multiple identifiers. And so the way in which we design this, this website is we want to make it as easy as possible to deal with. So we're trying to solve all those problems for you. So you put in a gene list. We try to figure out what gene you really mean. And if we can figure out what gene you really mean, we just go forward and we analyze that gene. Now, if the gene identifier that you use to describe your gene is not unique, and in a lot of cases, there's gene identifiers that aren't unique. And let me tell you, when you do like eight different organisms, you find a lot of weird special cases. So like in fly, there's gene identifiers that vary by capitalization. So S small mg is a gene. S big MG is a separate gene, and they're not linked in function at all. Right? Those are to two totally different genes. So, so we, we get all the gene ID mappings that we can from ensemble and ensemble plant, and then we go through and we remove identifiers that aren't unique or that don't correspond to protein coding genes at this point in time. So we'll, we'll identify most, we'll, we'll, most of the gene identifiers you put in we'll get. Some of them we won't get because they're not unique or because they've been annotated in some, some weird way in the database. So to address that problem, you can't sometimes have to go through and like update things a little bit. Or you could just say, well, you know, we got like 95% of the, the identifiers. That's pretty good. Oh, yeah, and we have gene annotations, uh, and I'll explain about that in a second. But basically, we do functional enrichment analysis on your gene list and all the other genes that we pulled up as being functionally linked to them. And then we report that information. Those gene uh, annotations come from gene ontology. And there's a variety of model organism databases that assign those annotations, and, including uh, GOA. OK, and these are the gene identifiers that we, we identify. Like I said, we're, we're doing all unique identifiers. Uh, and certainly, these are the, uh, the identifiers that we're pretty good at recognizing. If you give us some synonyms, sometimes we get them, especially if they're unique. Uh, and organism-specific names, we often get those as well. We might be a little bit out of date because to get these gene identifier mappings, we have to download the ensemble database. The ensemble database is really big, so we only do it about once every three months or so. So if you have a new gene, you might have to look around for the gene identifier that it corresponds to. OK, so right now we cover eight organisms. We have more than 2,000 networks. We have a, a web network browser. We also have a plugin that you guys have all downloaded, but I'm going to, with the exercise that we're going to do today is just based on the, uh, the network browser because it's the easiest thing to interact with. Uh, you saw that sometimes it can be a bit tricky to correspond to interact with Cyboscape, uh, and you know, but the idea is that you that I want you to learn you can get through the network browser. Okay. So what the difference is with our Cyboscape plugin, it has all the same functionality. Um, you can use it to get access to older gene mania data releases. So what happens is, about once or twice a year, we update our network database. When we update our network database, the analysis that you did might change, right? You get a different answer because you're looking at different networks. We think this is a problem if you published a paper using an analysis on an earlier database. You want people to be able to reproduce that. But we can't make that, that type of information available to you through the web all the time. 
So the solution that we've come up with is that we have each one of our old network releases available through the Cytoscape plugin. So even though you can't reproduce the analysis that you did on the network, on, on the website, if you're, it was using an older network database, you can reproduce it using Cytoscape. And like the way in which we do, the way in which we add more networks, we add more networks when we improve functionality, right? So we're not trying to break things by giving you more networks, we're trying to make things better. So you know, you get an, you get one answer from an analysis using an earlier network database. We bet you'll get a better answer if you use a later network database. But you know, your reviewers might want to reproduce what you've done. The other thing that you can do with the Cytoscape plugin, it's a bit complicated, but you can do it, is you can add new organisms by yourself. Right? And I can explain how you add new organisms. But basically you have to say you have to give us uh, a database that tells us how to map between all the different gene identifiers, and then you have to provide networks to us. But then you can do the same gene mania analysis that you would do on the website, but with the new organism. Um, and you can add, integrate our networks with other Cytoscape analysis, and then uh, Rob showed you some of that today. And then, you know, the website uses our servers. So when you put in a long query list, it's a, it's a lot of computation for us to do, and we're giving it to you for free. So we, we restrict the, the length of the query list that you get. It's not that things get so much slower necessarily on our side, they do a little bit, but they get really slow on your side because when you have the network browser, you're downloading something from us that has a lot of interactions between genes, and our network browser is, is implemented using JavaScript, which is a little bit slow sometimes. So when you get a network that has like 200 genes in it, it moves really slow if you try to move things around uh, using the, the, uh, the web network browser. Now, I think um, I just saw the alpha release. You know, within the next, hopefully, six months, we're going to have a, a brand new network browser that's going to be available through our website, which should, per, uh, which should allow you to, have G, uh, to use networks that have a lot more genes in it. But you know, we're, I've just seen the first version of this now. And the other good thing is you'll be able to use it because it's HTML5, you can use it on an iPad on your phone as well. Uh, you can't do that right now with GeneMania, you have to use your computer. So, so the Cytoscape plugin you can download. There's no restrictions, you can put as big a gene list as you want, right? And if your computer can handle it, your computer handles it, right? So the, the one thing to tell you about the Cytoscape plugin, I think some of you, like when you download this plugin, you, you've, been you, you, you've encountered this. There's two parts to the plugin, right? The first part is, is the code itself, but there's also the network database, right? And we're trying to compile all the network data that's readily available for organisms. So when you download uh, that network data, that's actually two gigs. That's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of information that's available for every one of the organisms. So it will take a little while for you to download the network database once you get the Cytoscape plugin downloaded. But it's like about half an hour. In general is how long it takes on a good link. Okay, and so I don't know how advanced, uh, what kind of advanced analysis you want to do, but uh, we also have a tool called Query Runner. And so what does Query, Query Runner do? Um, so um, Query Runner, does like gene function prediction, but kind of in an offline manner. So what do I mean by that? So say you say, okay, I want to predict the function of gene, uh, I want to predict genes that should be assigned to all the Go annotation categories, and there's 20,000 of those, right? So that would be 20,000 queries on our website, that would be 20,000 queries in Cytoscape, so we have like a command line tool that allows you to do that all at once. And the type of analysis that we like to do um, where we assess the added predictive value of new data, right? So you have like a new genetic interaction network and you want to say, well, how much does this genetic interaction network add to the total knowledge that we have about gene function? Like how much have we captured gene function as we know it using this, this interaction network, right? And so the way that we, we, we would do that analysis is, is that we would try to predict all the functions in gene ontology using the networks that are currently available, see how well we do, and then we'll add this new network to that background and see how much better our predictions get. Right? And so we love this type of analysis, um, and we've designed a tool so we can do it, but that's what this tool is called, Query Runner. All right, so string. 
Spring is our main competitor, or we are Spring's main competitor, I think would be the better way of saying it, because they're more popular than we are. Um, and this is the, the introduction to their website, and the website is, it looks very similar to ours. You can put in a protein name. Uh, there's one major difference that you can see between our website and, and String. It's, it says protein name instead of gene name, because String is very focused on proteins rather than genes. And they will do some organism auto detect, but they also they have uh, they have you can put in uh, hundreds of different organisms into string, or you can put in a single name, or you can put in multiple names. So you can answer the like, what does my gene do, or uh, find me more gene like genes like this question. You can also search by protein sequence or multiple sequences. And string also combines together different types of data sources, um, and there's a lot of information here available about string. Okay, and so here's the result of doing a query in Spring. Um, they're, they're, their results look very similar to ours. They actually now use our network display tool. Um, but it's the same type of idea. So the nodes correspond to proteins in this case. The color of the edges correspond to different types of data that link these proteins together. And there's something really cool about String is if you have a structure for the protein, you can click on the node and then see the structure. Right, and so then here are the predicted functional partners, in this case the RAD51, and these are the types of data that link these things together, and this score is, is some estimate of how likely this gene is to share function, a part of its function with this RAD51. Okay, so then here's a comparison, we can go through this, but you can read it by yourself. I mean, the main thing is, is that we're focused on genes, we do have thousands of networks, but we don't pre-compute the weights, we do it on kind of an online Manner. And you can actually upload your own network. So if you have network data that links genes together in your organisms that's not represented in our databases, you can upload it and then use it to analyze your, uh, your network. Also, we rely on different types of functional genomics data. So we have genetic interactions, which are a bit hard to measure among proteins. Um, we also have phenotypic information and chemical interactions. Okay, so functional interaction network. I think we covered that. Guilt by association we covered. Uh, gene recommender system, you guys know what it is now. Uh, direct interaction and label propagation. I spent a long time on that, I think you guys got it. Uh, bo -bo -bo. Be able to use gene recommender systems to answer two types of questions, and be able to uh, select the appropriate network weighting scheme to answer your questions about gene function. I'm gonna be around for a while, so if we didn't quite get through that point, you can ask me about it. All right, questions? Yeah. So the, the direct interaction versus label propagation? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So this here is, is a, like a false color measurement score. Okay, so it's high score to low score. Okay, so these are the positive examples. So these are the query list. And these are the genes you want to find more genes like this, right? These gray links indicate non-zero links in the network. So these are edges between the genes. So here I'm just, in this cartoon, I'm just giving all these edges the same weight. But the scoring does depend upon the weight of the edges. Okay. And so, so there's two ways of, of scoring the unscored genes here. Right? The first way of doing it is for every gene, you look at its neighbors, its immediate neighbors, and you see whether or not they were in the query list. And your score depends upon what proportion of them were in the query list. Okay, so here this gene has no neighbors in the query list, so its score is zero. This gene has no neighbors in the query list, so its score is zero. This gene has one of its one of its two neighbors in the query list, so it has a non-zero score. This gene has two of its three neighbors in the query list, so it has a non-zero score. In this kind of simple example, let's say that this one gets a score of half, because that's a proportion of its neighbors in the query list. And this gets a score of two-thirds, because that's a proportion of its neighbors in the query list. 
But in general, the score is going to depend on how strong the link is. Right? So if this, is, this link has strength 1, this link has strength 0.5, and this link, link has strength 0.5, then this gene should get a score of, like, say, 1 half. Sorry. 3 quarters. Right? Because the, the total linkage to the, the team's material is uh, 1.5 all out of 1 plus 0.5. That description of that algorithm is conceptually identical to every algorithm that uses direct interaction. It just looks at the direct neighbors of, uh, of a gene. So string does this as well. Yeah. Uh, query it is, is, it, is it four genes or? It's four genes, yeah. I four genes. Yeah. So this is, a, this is an organism that has 11 genes in its genome, oh, okay. four of which we know the function for. OK. Yeah. All right. OK. So that's, that's direct interaction. Now there's different ways to combine together like information about the number of genes in, in the query list of your direct neighbors and everything in the same. But essentially it's 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 the same idea as all these algorithms. The thing that's different about a label propagation algorithm is that genes that are not directly connected to the query list can still get non-zero scores. And the way that works, so there's actually the, the easiest way to describe it is you go to every one of the gene every gene in the network, in turn, that hasn't been scored, and you, you essentially implement direct interaction for that gene to give it a score. And then you use that score as the score of the gene next uh, when you look at its neighbors. Okay, so let me be a bit more clear about what I mean. Let's say these genes on the query list, they get a score of one, okay, and so, and you know, genes not on the query list start off with the score of zero. Okay, so now we choose this gene. We're going to calculate the score. I said the score is two thirds. This gene gets a score of one half. So now when we look at this gene, its score is going to be the average of the scores of, it, uh, of its neighbors. So what's the average of one half and two thirds? Uh, it's like five twelfths, maybe? Is that right? No, seven twelfths. No, I don't know. It's something between one half and two thirds. Okay, and then so and then this this the this should get a score of like a half. Wow. Okay, and then these things still get a score of zero. So now we have an initial score for these genes. Now we're going to go through and we're going to update that score, and we're going to continue updating that score by just taking the average of its neighbors until those scores stabilize, so they don't change anymore. And the way the algorithm is set up, their scores are guaranteed to stabilize at some point. And not only are they guaranteed to stabilize, using a little bit of linear algebra, you can, you can actually figure out what their stable values are. Right? So you don't have to do these updates, you just have to solve a, a, linear, uh, like a, um, a, a linear system of equations. Okay. So that's what label propagation does. It's just, so you can think because you're iteratively updating these scores, information about labels propagates through the network. But there's no way that these three genes down here, which don't have any links to any other genes, uh, to the genes in the, in the non-zero part of the network, there's no way they can get a score that's not zero. And you can also get this feeling that the score decreases as you move away from these positive genes. Well, since I developed the label propagation algorithm, <laughs> I have a strong opinion about this. Um, so in general, you don't get to choose because the gene recommender systems use one of these, these things. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, can you just speak up? And then actually every time we come up with a new network database, we re-benchmark all the predictions that we do. And our, our, our ability to recover gene function does improve every time we add new networks. Yeah. So we benchmark our predictions by saying, okay, what if you gave us like a subset of the nodes uh, of the genes annotated to this full functional category? How well could we recover the other genes that were in this category? So we, so like, 
Is there what, sorry? Yeah, all of our domain publications have this type of benchmarking. And so our, our initial publication came out in 2008 that describes the algorithm. Um, and then we've had two database publications uh, in NAR that describe the web interface and various versions of it. And then all the other tools that I told you about, the Query Runner tool and the, and the Silas Gate plugin tool, they have their own publications. And then we've also developed new versions of our algorithm to integrate different networks together. And then there's a biosemantics publication about that as well. And each one of those uh, contains benchmarking on how well we're doing at recovering from trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> That's true. That's not intentional though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. <laughs> I have been using these slides for about four years, so uh, you, you got a pretty good eye. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a cartoon, obviously. <laughs> Um, nothing. That's probably what happened is this edge didn't get moved to where it was supposed to be and it got selected or something. It's probably a weird thing. I don't know. 